Napoli fans around the world, welcome to Napoli Talk. It is another embarrassing defeat for Napoli at home against Champions League rivals Atalanta. Guys, this was a game that was absolutely a must-win for Napoli's chances of getting into the Champions League. And Napoli absolutely squander that opportunity. Not only that, but the performance today was shambolic. Guys, one of the worst. It's up there with the ones that we had against Torino, where we also lost 3-0. I mean, guys, we've lost 3-0 now at least three times this season against Torino, against Inter, now against Atalanta. This is a team that has serious serious issues and unfortunately uh, the good start that Calzona had just like Mazzari and just like Garcia has proven to be a bit of a deceit because this is not the the way to manage a team if you want to keep your job and try to bring Napoli back into the top four next season. I think this game seals it also for Calzona. It will be a revolution this summer, guys, because there is no way that these players, that this coach are going to are going to continue on with Napoli. I mean, the motivation for a lot of these guys, is just not there. They are past their prime, a lot of them. And, uh, you know, these are guys that last last year they were fighting for, for first, not even fighting, really, but they were comfortably first, and they just don't seem to have the mentality to fight for something that is maybe, according to their ego, beneath them, which is essentially fifth place. Um, but we, we can't afford as a club to have these people continue next year. And it has to be a revolution, guys. It absolutely has to be. And I know that, you know, if you change so many players, the coach and all that, you don't know what you're going to get, right? But here's the thing, guys. We have the certainty on one hand that if we keep this group of players, we're going to repeat what happened this year i'm certain of it i'm certain that we're not going to go back to the spalletti days with this group of players no matter which coach you put in front of them versus the uncertainty of a new group of players and at least that uncertainty we don't know whether it's going to be good or bad but at least there's a there's a chance it could be good whereas with this group of players I'm certain that it's going to continue on like this. So if I were managing this club, I would revolutionize this team. But I wouldn't go and buy players like, for example, Traore, like Dendonker, like Mazzocchi. Like I wouldn't go and buy players that come from Salernitana, that come from months and months and months of inactivity, that are trying to relaunch their careers. No, I would go for... Players that are established, players that are still hungry. And this is what our reserves that we've been building up over the last 15 years are going to have to be used for. There is no point in having 200 million sitting in the bank doing nothing if you don't use it at this moment in time. This is when you have to go and use it. And you have to try and build a new cycle. If you don't invest hard and wisely into this team, you might enter a spiral that you don't get out of. And you might you might forever be mid. There are other big clubs that have fallen into that trap and fallen hard. It's so important for De Laurentiis not to make that mistake. And he's already made that mistake in January. Remember when we were talking about the January transfer window, we said, you know, it's so important that he gets the right people on board. It's so important. Um, and a lot of people, maybe including myself, 
we're praising the fact that we didn't maybe overly commit on some players because we don't know who the manager is going to be in a few months time so it's not really worth investing that much but i think looking back maybe that's the wrong choice maybe it would have been better to go and and buy established players and then you know regardless of who the manager is going to be next season at least you've got an established player there which is likely going to adapt to different managers and 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 you know you had a chance to save the season you had a chance if you invested 30 35 million into a center back you had a chance to get into the champions league next season and that in itself would would more than enough return your investment so so yeah guys that that's kind of my view on, on napoli's situation so far before we get into the specific game um sorry for being a little bit late guys uh for this for this chat but uh there was there was a little bit of an element of that that i was i was a little bit too depressed to talk about this game um when yeah when the final whistle went i just said you know what i i need to i need to make myself a sandwich you know i need to i need to put something in my stomach that will at least make me feel a little bit better about my situation um because yeah i mean this was this was such an embarrassment today it was so frustrating dom is probably licking wounds it hurts to see so much uh to lose so much to a mediocre atalanta at home yeah and that that is also the case it's like this is a mediocre atalanta this is not the atalanta of i think a few years ago when you had Papu Gomez and Ilicic and all that. This is a very mediocre Atalanta, in my opinion, with one or two good players, such as Coop Miners, that Napoli did not buy this summer because they didn't want to invest 40, 50 million on a midfielder. They only wanted to invest maximum 35. And they ended up going cheap and they got Cayuste for 20, thinking that it was such a good thing to save all this money. And then guess what? Cayuste now is not even worth 5 million. Uh, so you've lost 50 million there just off that one player. And then he also doesn't guarantee you a step up in the team. No Champions League football. And guess what? You're going to have to spend now money again uh, to fill the hole that he's created because he, he's useless. He's not playing. Um, so not only did you waste 20 million, but you're probably going to have to now go and spend at least 30 as a replacement. You know, there, there's a saying... In Naples, I don't know if you guys know about it, but uh, it, it translated, it means, you know, saving money is never going to help you save money, which which means like, you know, if you save money and you buy something bad, eventually you're going to have to go and spend again to cover for what you spent because, you know, you spent something that's useless. Um, so, yeah, guys, don't don't try to cheap out on things that you really need. You know, it's like. If you need good furniture, buy good furniture. Don't buy a crappy chair and then it breaks after two months and you have to buy another chair again. I, I've done that mistake before. Um, all right, Dom, it's therapy time, says Flo Mo Shammer. Yeah, let's let's get started with this therapy. 3-0 uh, at home. Yeah, Ramani needs to be replaced. Nothing but a liability, says Maximus. He is the worst player on this team by far by far and he's kind of avoided a little bit of criticism recently because he scored against Sassuolo he scored against was it Sassuolo uh he scored against Barca and so you think oh well at least you know he's scoring but you can't really be judging a player off things that are let's say anomalies you know you can't really be judging a center back based on how many goals he scores unless he does that every game and it's clear that money doesn't do that every game you have to judge someone based on how they do their core activity his core activity is defending and he cannot do it if his life depended on it all right i would not trust that guy i would rather go out on the field myself and do a one-on-one -on -one against Neymar, then put him if my life depended on it. And it shouldn't be that way. You know, this, these guys are professional football players. 
Um, Paul De Rican says Osimen on an island. Olivella should just have started stated if Kvara wasn't playing. Started if Kvara wasn't playing. Way too long to bring on a second central player. And Gisa needs to be moved on from. Yeah. So this is very interesting. Look, first of all, I think Osimen had a decent game because he didn't get any service from from his players. Um, and I think he was he was one of the few. Him and Meret were one of the few that were fighting. Um, but, um, by the way, let me, let me block this Joshua Fabia guy, because I'm not sure, not sure I, I like him, I like him, uh, so let me just go into the, let me just go into the, the thing, um, hide user on this channel, there we go, okay, now, anyways, uh, speaking about Osimen, yeah, I, I like, um i liked his game today he he was fighting the thing about Oliveira, i 100 percent agree look we keep saying that kvara plays better when marurui is with him now the one game that kvara is not playing why are you playing marurui just play Oliveira. that's the best time to use Oliveira. it's when kvara is not there and it gives I, it gives the left wing or the left chain a little bit more uh, physicality because when you have Raspadori and Mario Rui on the same side, guys, I mean, there are basketball players that are taller than both of them combined. You need more physicality than Raspadori and Mario Rui both on the same flank. And that for me is such a huge mistake from Calzona. We really lacked physicality down on the left. So I think it's a wasted opportunity. And I'm not even going to get started on the fact that why are we playing Raspadori uh, as, as a winger on the left? First of all, I think if he is to be a winger, I, I prefer to see him on the right. Uh, but also we've got Lindstrom, who is naturally a left winger. That's his position. And if you're not going to play him as a starter now, then, you know, you're, you're, you're killing this kid. And I know we're not here to give out uh, minutes uh, like charity, but you'd think that Lindstrom deserves at least one chance in the season to, to be a starter. And if not this one, then I don't know which. Um, if you really wanted to play Raspadori, then play him on the right instead of Politano. But yeah, I don't know, man. It, it's 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 so weird the the formation, what happened there on the left. I even would have gone as far as not play Juan Jesus. To be honest, I think that it's been a tough week for him, emotionally. Um, probably you know felt a little bit of tension in this game maybe wasn't super concentrated for everything that's happened and i know it's nice to have him play and i know he's a professional and all that but it's a delicate game of football against atalanta and i think if you are if you don't maybe if you're not maybe a hundred percent focused then you might pay the price and that's exactly what happened with the second goal where he loses the ball and we paid the price uh Zielinski did play really well I, I agree with real rider I think our midfield is so technically bad at this moment in time that even a Zielinski which doesn't want to be there has already moved to Inter uh, hasn't played with us in ages even that level of Zielinski is still better than the other guys that we have um and that says a lot. That says a lot. Uh, I couldn't watch the game, uh, but the result, face palm, was it so bad? Yes, yes. And I envy people that did did not watch the game. Mana says, so hard for us to score, but so easy for us to concede Napoli in a nutshell. Yeah, and look, you guys, you know, you guys play the uh, predictor game, right? And I mean, just to show how little of you predicted such a good uh result for atalanta like you know at most you guys scored three points by the way one point is just for participation one point is because 
maybe you guessed that there were two yellow cards and another point maybe because you guessed that Di Lorenzo would get a yellow card but nobody predicted that it was going to be 3-0 Atalanta or that we wouldn't score a goal um so yeah just FYI on that one uh just to show you how surprising this result is on the one hand but also how not surprising it is if you really think about it if you really put our season into context then you would know that this is not a result that is actually that surprising. Di Lorenzo has been a shadow of himself this season. Yeah, I think he's really lacked leadership this season. I I can't help but think also on what happened last week with Acerbi and Juan Jesus and just the lack of involvement that Di Lorenzo has had um, in the last few days. Um, maybe also when it was on the field happening, um, you, you saw that when Acerbi and Juan Jesus went to speak to the referee, immediately Di Marco and Barella went as well to the referee, right? And, and defended Acerbi. And no one from Napoli was defending Juan Jesus. And that should be Di Lorenzo. Di Lorenzo should be right up there defending uh, him and, uh, you know, putting Acerbi, Di Marco and Barella in their place. But I don't know if he didn't want to do that because they are national teammates or not. But I just feel like there's a lack of leadership from Di Lorenzo this season. Disaster. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly what I said. We like physicality on the left, says Johnny. Uh, we need someone like Di Marco. Yeah, 100% or Grimaldo. Man, Grimaldo is playing so well this season. And this is someone that has literally been on Napoli's radar for like six seasons, right? Ever since Gulam got injured uh, in, back in 2017, so ages ago. And every time we've just let him let him go, you know, Uh Old Hard Rosanero, ciao Dom, indipendentemente dal risultato, buona Pasqua. Yeah, I know. Buona Pasqua a te, Old Hard Rosanero. But uh, they, really, they really intoxicated my, my Easter uh, and our Easter with this result. I mean, they ruined, they ruined Christmas, losing to Roma. Now they're ruining Easter uh, by losing to Atalanta. What else is there to ruin? What other holidays uh, that I celebrate? That's, I mean, pretty much those two. Um, but yeah, the Napoli's managed to ruin both of them. But yeah, Buona Pasqua, uh, Old Heart Rossonero. Guys, check him out if, if you want to know more about Milan. Uh, maybe, maybe he can do a little video on Pioli uh, and how he thinks he would do at Napoli. Maybe we would, we would all go and watch that. Um, he, know, he probably would know more about it than we do. Paul DeRican says we need to direct play through the middle more and not leave Ossi on an island. Kavara needs to be a 10 with two wide midfield. Yeah, I, we, we played much better when we were going through the middle, um, but it, it didn't happen too much. It happened once with Traore in the first half and once when Simeone made a pass towards Ossiman, uh, but we just don't do that enough this season. Tom, I am a little disappointed. You're usually very fair, but every week find excuses to defend uh jesus uh no i'm not defending jesus i'm not defending jesus i'm saying i wouldn't have played jesus regardless of regardless of his mistake i'm talking like regardless of his mistake i'm saying i don't think i would have played jesus today just because i as a coach wouldn't have felt that he would be a hundred percent concentrated i don't think that the mistake that he did is 100% due to that. There is 90% of the blame on Jesus being just inadequate for this level of football. 100%, I, I, like, I believe that. I, I really do believe that he's not good enough for this league. But I can't help but think that maybe 10% of the reason why he made that mistake is also because he's not fully switched on into the game. Um, with everything that's going on behind him. And just like we don't want to give people, you know, random opportunities to start if they don't deserve it. I don't think we should have given 
Juan Jesus the opportunity to start today just because of what happened last week. I think if anything, that that should have put him on the bench. Uh, obviously not as punishment, uh, but just as a, hey, like just take a few more days to refocus on on your profession. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's also hard, I think, for Calzona. Before we get into like the analysis, I think it's also hard to some extent Calzona this week to have made the team because he didn't train with a lot of these guys. He was with the Slovakian national team. So he was relying on the assistant coach. And as we learned with Garcia and Mazzari, this is not a group of players that you can just hand off to someone else. And this person can just train them for two weeks without a problem. We've seen that this group of players needs a serious coach to be training them. Because not everybody's capable of training this group of players. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have been on our third coach of the season so far. So, yeah, may maybe there was an element of that as well with his starting 11. What I will say about Calzona is that... I think he I think he came to to Napoli with like a very clear thesis, right? He came to Napoli with a very clear thesis which is I'm going to make Napoli great again with the players that made Napoli great, right? So he said in in his mind, I will just use the players that were here last season. I don't want to see Mazzocchi I don't want to see Lindstrom. I don't want to see Ngonje. I don't like the only reason he's putting Traore is because Zielinski has literally like left the club more or less officially already. He's he's still a Napoli player, but he's not really a Napoli player anymore. Um, but I mean, if that wasn't the case, if Zielinski still hadn't signed for Inter, he would be playing Zielinski 100%. Rightly so, he's a better player. But I'm saying, like, he's so obsessed with the thesis that I think he had coming into the into the job that I'm just going to reuse the same players that Spalletti had last season. And I think he lost track of guys like Ngonje that I think could help out, guys like Mazzocchi that, I, that were having a great few games under Mazzarri. You know, Mazzarri made Mazzocchi look better than Di Lorenzo. Honestly, honestly, Mazzocchi in the 10 or so games that he played, if you exclude the first one, he played better than, than Di Lorenzo has this season. And I think he was too rigid, Calzona, to, you know, uh, with his mindset and with the hierarchy that he gave the players. And I think what Calzona needed to do coming into this job was instead to say, look, I'm going to reset from zero. Whatever you did last season, that's great. But we've also got new players now. And if I'm here, there's a reason why I'm here. It's clearly because what happened in the past has not worked out this season. So let me, let me see what I've got, what resources I have. And, and let me put out what I think is the best possible eleven based on current form. And instead, he didn't do that. Otherwise, we would see Mazzocchi playing. Otherwise, we would see Ostigard playing. We would see Nathan, maybe. Nathan and Ostigard under Garcia, you know, did not do that bad. The the four or five games that they had together, whilst Juan Jesus and Rachmani were injured, they were not doing too bad. And I think that if we had kept that partnership of Nathan and Ostigard, and if Nathan did not get injured for so long, I think by now we would have started to see a bit of the of the you know the the rewards uh, from from those seeds that we that we planted. I, I still think that uh, yeah, the treatment that those two guys got is just not fair. When you consider that the two starting center backs are really really unwatchable really unwatchable are you going to be watching georgia in the euro says joanne bocovelli yeah i i'm interested in watching georgia um 
I'm going to try to watch as many games as I can with, in general, all the Napoli players. Obviously, I'm going to watch all the Italy games, uh, but obviously I'm going to have a special eye for Georgia. I want to see what Kvara can do in an international tournament, in his first, really. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm also going to keep a lookout for maybe some interesting players uh, that we might... Uh, be linked with so it's gonna be nice uh the only thing is is that like i hope that these games i haven't seen the schedule but i hope they don't have games like in the middle of the the work week you know like 2 p.m or something like that that will be tough um all right irakli says look dom kvara now is one of the players that makes a difference and if he has players in the team who knows how to play with him kvara will be much better one of his one of these players is Chuck Vetadze. Yeah, I mean, look, Kvara, we, we've seen his quality last season. We've seen it. We know we know he we know it's out there. We know that when we also know that when the whole team is playing well, then it's also easier for Osiman, Kvara, and all these guys to play well. Um it's it, it it's just hard for everybody this year. You know, when when Osiman was injured and we were losing, uh I remember a lot of people saying Napoli can't win without Osimen. And now look, we lost 3-0 and Osimen was playing. Other times we've had Kvara playing and Osimen out and people say um or we've had Osimen playing Kvara out and people say oh we can't win without Kvara, but then we've also lost many games with Kvara. So it's not really about like specific players um it's more just that the team in general is playing badly. And yeah, obviously it, it makes it even harder if you don't have Kvara or Osimen at their best. Anyways, let's go into the analysis of the game, guys. So it starts off with Atalanta in the first two minutes having a great chance uh, here. I think Juan Jesus does just enough to, to shove the Atalanta player a little bit off balance and he hits the post. Uh, but I mean, he is well and truly beaten with speed. And that's the issue that you get when you have a player like Juan Jesus playing for you uh, is that you're going to be beaten in speed. And then, you know, this this is an example of Napoli's lack of quality. I mean, I remember in this moment, Mairui had so much time and space to pick out a cross. And he waits like two seconds. The Atalanta player closes on him. And then Mario Rui hits him directly. You know, where you've got Osimen, Anguissa, Traore all making runs into the box. And I think this could have been a really dangerous cross if Mario Rui handled it a bit better. Uh, but there is just such a lack of technicality and skill at the moment. It's it's absolutely insane how 90% of our crosses are hitting the front man. We had this moment here with Traoré where he dribbles past a few players centrally. And I think that's where Napoli can really hurt teams. Because when Osimen kind of moves a little bit to the second post, it can create gaps in the middle. Like the one that we see here. No, because... Defenders tend to gravitate towards Osimen, maybe leaving a gap down the middle. And Traoré, I think, had a great chance once he skipped past this player to pass it on to Politano, who then would have been in an ideal position with his left foot to take a shot on across the goal. But instead here, he tries an extra dribble. And, you know, it's again a lack of lack of clear decision making or lack of lucidity when they're making decisions he he should have passed the ball to politano here um and then we get to some chances from atalanta and you can see that the napoli defense is struggling with how how we set up i mean we have a three versus three situation in the box uh with three atalanta players and three napoli players but for whatever reason, we are not positioned properly to deal with this. You know, this would have been very easy. Just have each player man mark their guy. You know, Juan Jesus on the guy in the front post, Rachmani in the middle, and Di Lorenzo 
on the right. Instead, we have, for whatever reason, our two center backs on one guy. And then we have Di Lorenzo having to mark two, which for me doesn't make any sense. So clearly, when that ball is played in the second post, Di Lorenzo, because he couldn't commit to the guy behind him, he's always going to be at a disadvantage. And thankfully, Meret today had the the guts to come out quite a few times, but it's not something that he usually does. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's worrying how, how badly we defend. Then we get to the goal, and it's crazy how with one pass from one of their center backs to their winger, they're able to completely bypass our midfield and we are way too slow to react and at this point when Atalanta get the ball here look how far they are from the box they are not even in our final third and yet this guy is able to go all the way near our box completely unchallenged uh, but another interesting thing to note is that once that ball is played all of a sudden we are at a numerical disadvantage where we've got four defenders up against five Atalanta players. And again, now it's Mario Rui that has to defend against two players. And he's even more at a disadvantage because he is just from a height point of view so challenged compared to those guys. So when that ball comes in, look, there is 17 centimeters of difference between uh, Mairo Rui and I think it's Hateboy you know that, that that's a lot that's roughly 17 centimeters I don't know is that five inches six inches something like that uh, I don't know let me see 17 divided by 2.4 that's seven inches difference between Mairo Rui and Hateboy that's a lot there's no way he's gonna win the header obviously he doesn't win the header and then Rachmani makes a mess of it and he can't clear the ball. And the way that he falls down like this is just comical. And uh, Atalanta score. But this is really bad setup by Napoli. There is a midfield that does not support our defense. We, for some reason, started playing Mairo Rui when we needed more physicality on the left. We talked about it, you know, when you have Kvara, you can maybe get away with Mario Rui, but when you have Mario Rui and Raspadori, you need someone taller, you need Oliveira. And especially, regardless of who's playing an attack, if you have a really tall uh, right wing back playing against you, such as Hatebor, then you definitely need someone taller like Oliveira to counter that, because you know that when the cross is coming into the second post, you are going to struggle. Then we get to a few chances that Napoli had. Uh, this is one where Anguissa actually plays a nice pass towards Osimen. And Osimen, he had one or two chances, half chances in this game, but didn't take them. Here, look, the Atalanta goalkeeper, you can see, has already committed to his dive uh, before Osimen actually takes a shot. I'm surprised. Osimen didn't try to dink the ball over the goalkeeper a bit more or maybe even take it past and around the goalkeeper. He could have even maybe tried crossing the ball to Raspadori who was making a run in the second post. I know it's extremely hard to see and these are things that happen like super quickly. But uh, when the goalkeeper goes down like that, Elite strikers should have the ability to react and and do something more um, because it, it, they've already basically decided where their body's going at this point and you can kind of adapt to it. Then we get to a chance that Atalanta had and again, you can see here how badly positioned we are in defense. For whatever reason, nobody picks up this run and you've got Di Lorenzo now having to deal with three Atalanta players. Uh, neither Traore nor Politano help out Di Lorenzo. They don't spot the run. They let this guy completely through 
And thankfully, when that pass comes in, Meret once again shows that he's improving on this aspect that we always criticize him, which is that he always stays on his goal. But today, he made a very good double save in this in this instance. And, and he did another one as well in the second half. So this is the double save. Very, very good from Meret. Uh, and then we get to Atalanta's second goal, which is also pretty funny. You've got um, Rachmani on Skamaka. Uh, he, he's always stepping out of, of position. Um, Skamaka doesn't control the ball very well. It goes to Juan Jesus. And Juan Jesus here, he's very flat-footed. He has the possibility to immediately pass it to one of his uh, teammates in midfield. Instead, he takes a touch. He gets closed down by Skamaka. He loses the physical battle. Uh, then it re gets returned back to Skamaka, who from that kind of position, you know he's going to score. That's Skamaka's position. That's where he scores his most lethal goals and it's 2-0 Atalanta at the break we make some substitutions we bring on Zielinski uh, for Traore we bring on Ngonje for Raspadori and Zielinski immediately shows that he is a level above everybody else technically uh, he hits an incredible post uh, with his left foot and goes out uh, a million different uh, things happen and the ball somehow doesn't go in. Another thing here where Lobotka takes a shot, it deflects off Osimen, and the goalkeeper is almost about to dive to the other side but manages to switch and save the ball, hits it onto the post and it goes out and and we, we don't manage to score in this case either. Um, then there's this chance here where Di Lorenzo passes the ball to Osimen. Osimen flicks it onto Lindstrom. Lindstrom at this point, look, he is ahead of Scalvini and he's heading directly towards the goal. But obviously the ball that Osimen gives him is facing away from the goal towards the corner flag. But this is where, this is the difference between a good striker and a great striker or a, a, a bad striker and a great striker because a great striker would intercept the ball put his hands out like this you can't see it but put his hands out like this and block scalvini with his hand and use his body strength to keep scalvini behind him and he would cross paths with scalvini and at that point scalvini who would be behind him has to back off because otherwise if he trips uh lindstrom then it's a uh, last man foul instead what does Lindstrom do? He follows the direction that the ball is going. So instead of crossing Scalvini, they, they take parallel lines. And when you do that, it allows Scalvini the chance to then stick out a foot and tackle uh, the ball because Lindstrom is not defending it with his body. And by the way, Lindstrom, at this point, if he is going to move to the right, he needs to still keep his left hand blocking Scalvini. You're allowed to do that. Watch the Harry Kane goal against Italy a few months ago. It's exactly the same thing with Harry Kane in Lindstrom's position and Scalvini in the exact same position that he's in. And you see that Harry Kane cuts in front of Scalvini, pushes him back with his left hand, crosses over... And, and, and scores and that's the difference between a guy like Harry Kane who scores goals who is a professional football player with you know capital letters versus Lindstrom who I don't know man I don't know what he's doing I mean he, he really lacks at times fundamental technical skills um, a little bit like Lozano couldn't stop the ball last year Lindstrom just does not know how to use his body. And I, I am so surprised there are people at this level of football that just do not have the basic technical knowledge of how to of how to play with the ball, of how to play football. You know, it, it's it's such an obvious thing to do. Uh, 
but yeah i i don't know i mean some of these players really really surprise me um just the mistakes that they do uh then here we've got a chance with uh Osimen getting into the back of this uh, pass by Simeone Simeone came on really well so did everybody that came on as a sub Zelinski Simeone Engonje they all except Lindstrom uh they all came on really well and then um and then Osimen you know just doesn't beat the goalkeeper kind of unlucky here again and then Atalanta scored their third goal in the final minutes with Lobotka and Rachmani not able to get the ball off Lukman. They both try to tackle. He wins both duels, lays it off to his teammates, and then Coop Miners runs in behind them. And again, you've got you've got Rachmani in absolutely no man's land. Look, Rachmani, if you're gonna step out of this defense, I keep telling you, man, oh, I, I hate it. I keep telling this guy this i wish i wish they would listen to me if you're gonna step out of your back four you better get the ball either get the ball or get the man it's the 87th minute all right i i get it we're, we're still gonna lose 2-0 but if you're not gonna get the ball at least make a foul on lookman because if you allow lookman the chance to lay it off to someone else then you are screwed you are in this position where you are three meters behind where you're supposed to be and he's done this against Barca and he's done this against Milan and he's done this I, I like I, I can't I can't stand him anymore the amount of times that this guy steps out of position and he leaves this massive hole at the back I'm just done with this guy I'm just done completely with this guy um, and then Coop Miner, uh, look, Coop Miner, look at, look at how he handles this compared to, compared to Lindstrom. Coop Miner, with his right hand, puts an arm in front of Juan Jesus, keeps himself between Juan Jesus and the ball, protects the ball, and then shoots. If you go back to the other example with Lindstrom, look at this, Lindstrom is not protecting the ball. It's Scalvini that gets in between him and the ball. And he's not using his arm to protect it. So, you know, this is the difference between a real football player such as Kubmaine versus someone that I'm still yet to figure out how he made it to this level, which is Lindstrom. Um, but yeah, um, that's, that's that. These are my player ratings. Um, I'm going to give a really bad score to all the starters for having gone down 2-0 in the first half. For me, the only players that kind of can save themselves are Osimen for the amount of effort that he put in trying to win every single duel, the ball and everything. But unfortunately, his final product was not there. So I can't really go above a 6.5. Lobotka, 6. I mean, he's playing against some real bad people around him. So poor him. Uh, but he tries his best. Man at eight. I mean, for a goalkeeper to concede three goals and be man of the match just tells you everything. Um, I feel bad for the guy uh, today. But at least he was able to put on a bit of a performance. And then the subs, uh, I think they came on the, the, the front, the top three that you see there. I think they came on really well. Uh, they brought a bit of energy. They brought a bit of technicality, a bit of skill, a bit of desire. Unfortunately, Lindstrom, I'm not going to put him as low as the starters because, you know, this this 3-0 is not really his fault. Uh, but he keeps having these half chances, sometimes even more than half chances, to make a difference, to score a goal. I mean, this guy has not yet scored a goal. We're 30 seasons in. We're 30 games in, plus eight in the Champions League and one in the Coppa Italia, and this guy still hasn't scored a goal? Like, come on, man. Um, you know, at some point, when you're paid 30 million, you're expected to take at least one of these half chances, and he, he probably gets one every other game, you know? So I'm, I'm done with him as well. I'm done with him. I'm done with Ragmani. I'm done with Angisa. I'm done with a lot of these players.
thank you for last year. Thank you. I appreciate it. But we can't keep focusing on that. You know, we got to move on. It's it, it, it's just too many games now that they've they've let me down. They've let us down. Nathan isn't bad. I know. I keep saying Nathan is not bad. Not honestly, he's way better than Rachmani, my, or at least has the potential to be way better than Rachmani and Jesus. I I think if, if we had played Ostigor and Nathan all season, by now we would have I think a pretty decent back line. Um, you know, obviously you got to give the kid the benefit of the doubt a little bit. You got to let him make mistakes, but you you know it's a process and. You hope that by the time that next season comes, he's ready. But he won't be next season because he didn't get the chance this season to make those mistakes. So, yeah. We should have sacked Garcia in the October break or else kept him until the end. We massively underperformed our XG back then. Honestly, I do think that we would have been better off with Garcia um, in terms of the results. But at the same time... At the same time, it was it was just so toxic between him and the players and the and the the fans. And I think it took other three coaches or other two coaches to come in for fans to realize, okay, maybe it's not the problem of this specific coach. It's the problem of the players. It's the problems of many different things. Um, but we would have all just kept believing that it that Garcia is the problem um, if Garcia had stayed. Because we wouldn't have had the evidence to show that it's not just him that's the problem. Um, would, would we have been a better off team with Tudor or with, you know, someone else other than these other two coaches that came in? We don't know. But I do think that... Even if a better coach came in, I think at most this club would have been fourth or fifth. Maybe not as down as we are now in, in what, ninth, tenth? I don't even want to check. Maybe not as bad as that. Mazzari and to some extent Calzona really, really screwed up. But I don't think, you know, I don't think Conte would have come in mid-season or Tudor come in mid-season. And we would have been top three. No. No, no. They wouldn't have had that much of an impact. Ah. Would you do a video showing what could next season teams be? Or how would you want it to be in terms of players and coach and formation, maybe? Says Helcom. I think now that I am pretty much... I'm pretty much certain that we won't be getting Champions League football next season. I think it gives me a better indication of of kind of what our budget might be and our strategy might be. Um, but it's tough. I mean, I could make it based off like who I think could be the next coach. Um, or maybe I could say like if it's Conte then I think the team will be like this if it's Pioli I think the team will be like that if it's Italiano or I could say like I could do a video of like what if De Laurentiis hired me uh, what would I do with a given budget it, it's obviously way more hypothetical and way more like fantasy land and not maybe as relevant but uh, you know um, it would be easier to make a video like that, obviously, because then it would just be my opinion on stuff. Um, and I don't have to put myself in the shoes of Conte. I mean, I mean, if you get Conte, like, you know he's going to ask for Lukaku, right? <laughs> he's just going to ask for Lukaku if you get Conte in. Um, so maybe that one's easy. Conte is just a Lukaku merchant. He can't perform without Lukaku. Anyways, let's go to the press conference let's see if they had a press conference first of all i hate the fact that they don't have a press conference before the game man i hate it <sighs> uh, 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 uh. 
Let's see what they say. Let me get this press conference up and running. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, let me get some water as well. All right, let's let's read this press conference from Calzona. <clears throat> All right, Calzona says, uh, well, they ask him, the, the journalist asks him, the public has uh, sort of gone against the team for the first time. Um, did Juan Jesus, um, was Juan Jesus conditioned uh, by recent events? Um, and Calzona says, well, yeah, we need to accept the fact that the fans protested. Um, the Juan Jesus situation did not, did not influence the team at all. Uh, we lacked a bit of so solidity at the back. We are very fragile and we don't have the ball. We do not know how to defend as a block. We keep chasing the opposition and that's not how it should be. Uh, against Inter, we were a bit more solid, but today, no. Against these physical teams, if you are not solid, it is extremely tough. They ask him, you know, why is there no enthusiasm maybe with the players? And he says, no, um, enthusiasm is there because the team did try until the 90th minute to recover the game. Uh, a team without enthusiasm would not have created so many chances in the second half. But I have to admit, there is a lot of confusion. Um, we do create chances, but they are not because of uh, mechanisms and well thought of uh organization and structures but just because of casual situation so i'm glad he admits that at least unlike mazzari that would just be like oh but we created chances and i realize that they're down to like random things at least Kazuna realizes that we're not creating chances um the way we should do they ask him if the national teams have an impact on this and he says i already spoke about the situation uh, coaching both a national team and a club, uh, you can only do it in certain moments like these. Um, we could only work on the physical aspect of things because we lack the players to work on tactical aspects during the days when there was the national team. Um, so you just focus on the physical aspects and that's what happened in this case. Um, are there any European possibilities for Napoli, they ask him. And he says, the Champions League is quite far now, we have to be honest. Uh, but for the Europa and Conference League, uh, we're still in play. Oh, God, man. I mean, if we get the Conference League... Um, and they ask him, you know, does this team have what it takes... Does this team have what it takes to, uh, you know, finish the season strongly? And uh, he says, well, if they don't have it, they got to find it. Uh, we have to honor this season. Um, and, uh, you know, me and me and the guys, we, we got to, you know, we got to step it up. We have to do more and we have to try to finish the season in an honorable way as much as possible. Um, I ask him, was this defeat more about... Napoli playing badly or Atalanta playing good and he says look obviously Atalanta there's a lot of merit to how they play uh, but there's also a lot of things that we could have done better we're very fragile um, and uh, you know it's the first game since I'm here that we didn't score a goal we need to find more defensive solidity because like this it's not okay um, and uh, it's not necessarily a problem just with the defensive four but of the entire team if only one person is pressing and not the entire team it, it becomes very difficult today we didn't do it well um the defensive uh part of the game needs to be well organized and today it just wasn't this year you know this team has had three coaches um and it just I created a lot of confusion with the players. They ask him, why did you play Raspadori on the left? Um, and he says, Raspadori trains well and he gives me a lot of guarantees. Um, 
it can also happen that then he doesn't play super well. I don't think that he did. Uh, I don't. And then he says, I don't think that whoever replaced him did any better. Ouch. Um, he wants to play a bit more centrally, but he can adapt very well. I'm happy for Simeone. When we changed formation, we created something a little bit extra, but uh, there was a bit more vulnerability when we changed formation. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, he says, when we change formation, uh, Lobotka and Angisa have to cover more ground. Um, it, it puts them under more difficulty. Um, and, you know, it, it just makes things more difficult. Okay, that's Calzona. Speaking about... Uh, speaking about Raspadori and Simeone, um, before we close, before we close this, this live, speaking about them... Let me move the camera a little bit. Speaking about them a little bit, um, Raspadori, you know, they keep saying this excuse that he can't be judged when he plays on the left and he can't be judged when he plays on the right and he can't be judged when he plays as a number 10 because he wants to be a striker and, and I'll like, okay, fine. But hear me out. I mean, Mertens, okay, Mertens, he could play in every position in attack. You put him on the left and he plays well. You adapt him as a striker, he plays well. You put him as a number 10, he plays well. You put him on the right, he could play well. He did that with his national team, playing on the right at times, because you would have uh, sometimes Hazard on the left. So, I'm not saying that we should be comparing Raspadori to Mertens, right? I'm not saying that. But I also don't want people to start thinking that Raspadori is this amazing player that if only you put him in the right position then you would get something good out of him Raspadori is an okay player but if he was really a, a really good player then I think as a really good player you should have the ability to also play at least somewhat good in other positions especially if you have you know, a physique that is a physique that can play in other positions. Obviously, you wouldn't put you wouldn't put a guy that's two meters tall left wing, right? I mean, no. But Raspadori does have left foot, right foot. He's got that low center of gravity. I don't think that his game is that affected whether he's playing left, right, center, or up top. I really don't think so. Um, I just think he's an inconsistent player. But I doubt that you would actually get that much more out of Raspadori if you were to play him in his favorite position. He'd give you 10% more, 15% more. But it's not like we are, it's not like we are ruining a guy that has... 2x more possibility, in my opinion. So this whole narrative of Raspadori, we're not playing him in the right position. Like, I get it, but how much is that really influencing him? Uncle Sharma, welcome onto the video. Uh, he says, Raspa needs to move to Inter. 352 is perfect for him. You know what? Uh, if you want, if you want, we we can we can give you a few other players. I mean, I've got a guy. Um, his name's Lindstrom. I've got another guy. His name's Traore. I've got another guy. His name is Cayuste. I've got another guy. His name's Juan Jesus. He might not be the most welcome in that team, to be fair. Um, Rachmani. You know, you you can have all those players if if you really want Napoli players, man. I will, I will be happy to walk them to the airport and deliver them to you. You just you just got to let me know and I make that happen, okay? Um and just give me DiMarco, man. Just give me DiMarco. That's all I ask. 
I will do a 10 for 1 swap for you. Pick 10 Napoli players. Just give me Di Marco. Um, I think he's he's such a good player. But yeah. Um, Raspa is ass. Yeah. Um, I don't think he's ass, man. I don't think he's... He's not bad. I'm not saying he's bad. I'm saying there's always this huge debate of like, oh, well, of course he didn't play well. He he's playing on the left or oh, of course he didn't play well he's playing on the right but it's like no man he's not playing well just because he's not he's not that type of player to always play well even when he's up top or at a number 10 i mean we see it with italy spalletti has played him in his preferred position with italy a lot and it's just he's so hit and miss he will have a game where he will score a great goal and be very active and all that. And then he will have another game where he is completely absent. And that's just Raspadori. And it just so happens to be the case that when he is playing one of these games where he's more absent, it happens to be that he's on the left or right. And people would then go, ah, well, it's because he's playing on the left. It's like, no, man, it's just Raspadori. It's just what he is. He's, he's not, he's not that elite level of player. Um, you know, there, there's just levels to this, and he's an he's an average player in my opinion. He's got great technique at times, but not consistent. And people confuse confuse that with with the positions that he's playing in. But for example, Elmas, you know, he was another player that we didn't really know what position he really was. But you put him on the left or right or in attack or whatever, and he will perform seven times out of ten raspadori performs three times out of ten you know what i'm saying so yeah um as for simeone um i think he's i think he's he's gonna go right he's gonna leave he's gonna go to lazio i think he deserves to be a main striker um he spent two years on the bench and these guys ultimately what do they want in life, right? These guys, I mean, they, they've made money. They've won a Scudetto. Obviously, you can win more. Obviously, you can make more money. But at the end of the day, these guys just want to play football, right? That's when they're happy. And I think having achieved what he achieved with Napoli, now Simeone would rather go and play 90 minutes every game for Lazio rather than be on the bench every game for Napoli, you know? Um, unless he has that guarantee that he's winning another trophy here. But we're not. We're not going to be able to guarantee that. So I think he's going to want to move. Uh, I think a lot of players that are on the bench feel that way. And last year, it was just very easy to keep everybody happy, even the guys that were on the bench, because they all of a sudden were in a context where they were going to win the title. Man, if I was in that dressing room and you gave me three seconds on the field, I would be buzzing. I would be so happy to even contribute three seconds to a title-winning team. All of a sudden, if I'm in that team, and I'm speaking me, like, and that I'm not a professional at all, and you, you put me on the bench, even I would be upset. I mean, like, I don't want to be on this bench. Man, let me play. I bet you I can do better than Lindstrom. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, it's hard to keep players happy on the bench when you're not winning, even if they're not the best players, you know? Even if they're average players, but even average players have a big ego. They want to play. And uh, yeah, so I think Simeone, he's going to be on his way out for sure. For sure. Um, because uh, even when Osimhen leaves... It's clear that he's not going to be our guy. He he kind of had that chance earlier this season, didn't take it. And so, you know, thank you. Uh, thanks for the effort. Thanks for the commitment to the team. He really, I think, cares about Napoli. He was really one with the club and the city. But we need something else, right? Um, if we want to go back to the top, we need to find a new victor. We need to find a new Cavani, a new Higuain, a new, you know, someone that will break records someone that will score 30 goals a season that's the type of player that napoli needs 
if we're gonna come back to the top and we're just not gonna have that with Simeone Simeone on his best season could score 20 goals and that's not really enough we need someone that's 25 and above if we're gonna if we're gonna actually try to win the league again um it doesn't sound like a lot, but that extra five, six goals, that's the difference between first place and third or fourth at times. Because if those five, six goals are all winning goals, then all of a sudden that's 10, 12 points extra. So the difference between a striker that can score 25 and a striker that can score 20, it's big. It's very big. It's the difference between a Champions League team and a title winning team so Simeone good enough I think on a good season to be a Champions League worthy striker is he good enough to lead a team to the Scudetto by himself no I don't think he's got 25 goals in him anyways guys that is my that is my live uh, if you have not yet smashed the like button then what are you doing bro Go ahead and smash it. And then, uh, I guess, have a good Easter. And if you don't celebrate Easter, well, then just have a good weekend and try to forget about everything that's happened in the last five hours. So, yeah, let me get maybe one more question. Um, do you think from Gabbard123, do you think Adele will invest in the upcoming transfer windows? Sounds like he's going to bring in some good players, but you never know. With him, I think he has to. I think I think he's learned his mistake. And if he hasn't, man, if he hasn't, that's worrying, right? You would think that you, you've learned your mistake after this summer and this winter. And it's going to hurt him, this lack of Champions League football. And the, and the fact that we missed out on the FIFA Club World Cup. It's going to hurt him. And he's not going to want to repeat that experience again. Then again, he might also think, well, you know, the FIFA Club World Cup is every five years, so I don't really need a team next year. I just need to have a competitive team in two, three years' time leading up to that World Cup. Um, because if I invest heavily now, I'll probably have to invest again in three or four years within this five-year cycle. So he might think of it that way. And so we might go under two, three seasons of averageness and then really push on a bit later. I don't know. Might happen. Might not. I really hope he, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't mess around too much. But you never know with him. You never know. Anyways, guys, that is... Oh, what is that? Jesus. Uh, that, that piece of hair is sticking out. That's crazy. Anyways, guys, uh, that is everything. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you for joining. And as always, Forza Napoli sempre. Ciao.